Section 25 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1, by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G.B. Ives. Section 25 the Borgias, chapter 14. The Duke of Valentinois had continued his road towards Chita di Castello and Perugia, and had seized these two towns without striking a blow, for the Vitelli had fled from the former, and the latter had been abandoned by Gian Paolo Bagliano, with no attempt whatever at resistance. There still remained Siena, where Pandolfo Pedrucci was shut up, the only man remaining of all who had joined the league against Caesar but Siena was under the protection of the French. Besides, Siena was not one of the states of the church, and Caesar had no rights there. Therefore he was content with insisting upon Pandolfo Petrucci's leaving the town and retiring to Lucca, which he accordingly did. Then all on this side being peaceful and the whole of Romagna in subjection, Caesar resolved to return to Rome and help the Pope to destroy all that was left of the Orsini. This was all the easier because Louis the Twelfth having suffered reverses in the kingdom of Naples, had since then been much more concerned with his own affairs to disturb himself about his allies. So Caesar, doing for the neighborhood of the Holy See the same thing he had done for the Romagna, seized in succession Vicovario, Serra, Palumbura, Lanzano, and Cervetti, when these conquests were achieved, having nothing else to do now that he had brought the pontifical states into subjection from the frontiers of Naples to those of Venice, he returned to Rome to concert with his father as to the means of converting his duchy into a kingdom. Caesar arrived at the right moment to share with Alexander the property of Cardinal Gian Michel, who had just died, having received a poison cup from the hands of the Pope. The future king of Italy found his father preoccupied with a grand project. He had resolved, for the feast of St. Peter's, to create nine cardinals. What he had to gain from these nominations is as follows. First, the cardinals elected would leave all their offices vacant. These offices would fall into the hands of the Pope, and he would sell them. Secondly, each of them would buy his election more or less dear according to his fortune. The price, left to be settled at the Pope's fancy, would vary from 10,000 to 40,000 ducats. Lastly, since as cardinals, they would by law lose the right of making a will, the Pope, in order to inherit from them, had only to poison them. This put him in the position of a butcher who, if he needs money, has only to cut the throat of the fattest sheep in the flock. The nomination came to pass, the new cardinals were Giovanni Castellaro Valentine, Archbishop of Trani, Francesco Remolini, Ambassador from the King of Aragon, Francesco Soldarini, Bishop of Volterra, Melchiori Copus, Bishop of Brissina, Nicholas Friesque, Bishop of Fregius, Francesco di Sprate, Bishop of Leome, Adriano Castellense, Clerk of the Chamber, Treasurer General, and Secretary of the Briefs, Francesco Boris, Bishop of Elva, Patriarch of Constantinople, and Secretary to the Pope, and Giancomo Casanova, Proto Notary and Private Chaplain to His Holiness. The price of their simony paid and their vacated offices sold. The Pope made his choice of those he was to poison. The number was fixed at three, one old and two new. The old one was Cardinal Casanova, and the new ones Melchior Copus and Adriano Castellense, who had taken the name of Adrian of Carnetta from that town where he had been born, and where, in the capacity of clerk of the chamber, treasurer general, and secretary of briefs, he had amassed an immense fortune. So when all was settled between Caesar and the Pope, they invited their chosen guests to supper in a vineyard situated near the Vatican, belonging to the Cardinal of Cornetto. In the morning of this day, the 2nd of August, they sent their servants and the steward to make all preparations, and Caesar himself gave the Pope's butlers two bottles of wine prepared with the white powder resembling sugar, whose mortal properties he had so often proved, and gave orders that he was to serve this wine only when he was told, and only to persons specially indicated. 
the butler accordingly put the wine in a sideboard apart bidding the waiters on no account to touch it as it was reserved for the pope's drinking the poison of the borgias say contemporary writers was of two kinds powder and liquid the poison in the form of powder was a sort of white flour almost impalpable with the taste of sugar and called contorella its composition is unknown the liquid poison was prepared we are told in so strange a fashion that we cannot pass it by in silence we repeat here what we read and vouch for nothing ourselves lest science should give us the lie a strong dose of arsenic was administered to a boar as soon as the poison began to take effect he was hung up by his heels convulsions supervened and a froth deadly and abundant ran out from his jaws it was this froth collected in a silver vessel and transferred into a bottle hermetically sealed that made the liquid poison towards evening alexander the sixth walked from the vatican leaning on caesar's arm and turned his steps toward the vineyard accompanied by cardinal carafa but as the heat was great and the climb rather steep the pope when he reached the top stopped to take breath then putting his hand on his breast he found that he had left in his bedroom a chain he always wore round his neck which suspended a gold medallion that enclosed the sacred host he owed this habit to a prophecy that an astrologer had made that so long as he carried about a sacred wafer neither steel nor poison could take hold upon him now finding himself without his talisman he ordered monsignor carafa to hurry back at once to the vatican and told him in which part of his room he had left it so that he might get it and bring it him without delay then as the walk had made him thirsty he turned to a valet giving signs with his hand as he did so that his messenger should make haste and asked for something to drink caesar who was also thirsty ordered the man to bring two glasses by a curious coincidence the butler had just gone back to the vatican to fetch some magnificent peaches that had been sent that very day to the pope but which had been forgotten when he came here so the valet went to the under butler saying that his holiness and monsignor the duke of romagna were thirsty and asking for a drink the under butler seeing two bottles of wine set apart and having heard that this wine was reserved for the pope took one and telling the valet to bring two glasses on a tray poured out this wine which both drank little thinking that it was what they had themselves prepared to poison their guests meanwhile carafa hurried to the vatican and as he knew the palace well went up to the pope's bedroom a light in his hand and attended by no servant as he turned round a corridor a puff of wind blew out his lamp still as he knew the way he went on thinking there was no need of seeing to find the object he was in search of but as he entered the room he recoiled a step with a cry of terror he beheld a ghastly apparition it seemed that there before his eyes in the middle of the room between the door and the cabinet which held the medallion alexander the sixth motionless and livid was lying on a bier at whose four corners there burned four torches the cardinal stood still for a moment his eyes fixed and his hair standing on end without strength to move either backward or forward then thinking it was all a trick of fancy or an apparition of the devil's making he made the sign of the cross invoking god's holy name all instantly vanished torches bier and corpse and the seeming mortuary chamber was once more in darkness then cardinal carafa who has himself recorded this strange event and who was afterwards pope paul the fourth entered baldly and though an icy sweat ran down his brow he went straight to the cabinet and in the drawer indicated found the gold chain and the medallion took them and hastily went out to give them to the pope he found supper served the guests arrived and his holiness ready to take his place at table as soon as the cardinal was in sight his holiness who was very pale made one step towards him carafa doubled his pace and handed the medallion to him but as the pope stretched forth his arm to take it he fell back with a cry instantly followed by violent convulsions an instant later as he advanced to render his father assistance caesar was similarly seized the effect of the poison had been more rapid than usual for caesar had doubled the dose and there is little doubt that their heated condition increased its activity the two stricken men were carried side by side to the vatican 
where each was taken to his own rooms. From that moment they never met again. As soon as he reached his bed, the Pope was seized with a violent fever, which did not give way to emetics or to bleeding. Almost immediately it became necessary to administer the last sacraments of the church, but his admirable bodily constitution, which seemed to have defied old age, was strong enough to fight eight days with death. At last, after a week of mortal agony, he died, without once uttering the name of Caesar or Lucretia, who were the two poles around which had turned all his affections and all his crimes. His age was seventy-two, and he had reigned eleven years. Caesar, perhaps because he had taken less of the fatal beverage, perhaps because the strength of his youth overcame the strength of the poison, or maybe, as some say, because when he reached his own rooms he had swallowed an antidote known only to himself, was not so prostrated as to lose sight for a moment of the terrible position he was in. He summoned his faithful Michelotto, with those he could best count on among his men, and disposed this band in the various rooms that led to his own, ordering the chief never to leave the foot of his bed, but to sleep lying on a rug, his hand upon the handle of his sword. The treatment had been the same for Caesar as for the Pope, but in addition to bleeding and emetics, strange baths were added, which Caesar had himself asked for, having heard that in a similar case, they had once cured Ladislaus, king of Naples. Four posts, strongly welded to the floor and ceiling, were set up in his room, like the machines at which farriers shoe horses. Every day a bull was brought in, turned over on his back and tied by his four legs to the four posts. Then, when he was thus fixed, a cut was made in his belly a foot and a half long, through which the intestines were drawn out. Then Caesar slipped into this living bath of blood, when the bull was dead. Caesar was taken out and rolled up in burning hot blankets, where, after copious perspirations, he almost always felt some sort of relief. Every two hours Caesar sent to ask news of his father. He hardly waited to hear that he was dead before, though still at death's door himself, he summoned up all the force of character and presence of mind that naturally belonged to him. He ordered Michelotto to shut the doors of the Vatican, before the report of Alexander's decease could spread about the town, and forbade any one whatsoever to enter the Pope's apartments until the money and papers had been removed. Michelotto obeyed at once, went to find Cardinal Casanova, held a dagger at his throat, and made him deliver up the keys of the Pope's rooms and cabinets then under his guidance took away two chests full of gold which perhaps contained one hundred thousand roman crowns in specie several boxes full of jewels much silver and many precious vases all these were carried to caesar's chamber the guards of the room were doubled then the doors of the vatican were once more thrown open and the death of the pope was proclaimed although the news was expected it produced none the less a terrible effect in rome for although Caesar was still alive, his condition left every one in suspense. Had the mighty Duke of Romagna, the powerful condottieri who had taken thirty towns and fifteen fortresses in five years, been seated, sword in hand, upon his charger, nothing would have been uncertain of fluctuating even for a moment. For, as Caesar afterwards told Machiavelli, his ambitious soul had provided for all things that could occur on the day of the Pope's death except the one that he should be dying himself. But being nailed down to his bed, sweating off the effects the poison had wrought, so though he had kept his power of thinking he could no longer act, but must needs wait and suffer the course of events, instead of marching on in front and controlling them. Thus he was forced to regulate his actions no longer by his own plans, but according to circumstances. His most bitter enemies, who could press him hardest, were the Orsini and the Colanas. From the one family he had taken their blood, from the other their goods. So he addressed himself to those to whom he could return what he had taken, and opened negotiations with the Colanas. Meanwhile, the obsequies of the Pope were going forward. The vice-chancellor had sent out orders to the highest among the clergy, the superiors of convents, and the secular orders, not to fail to appear, according to regular custom, on pain of being despoiled of their office and dignities, each bringing his own company to the Vatican, to be present at the Pope's funeral. Each therefore appeared on the day and at the hour appointed at the pontifical palace, 
whence the body was to be conveyed to the church of St. Peter's, and there buried. The corpse was found to be abandoned and alone in the mortuary chamber, for every one of the name of Borgia, except Caesar, lay hidden, not knowing what might come to pass. This was indeed well justified, for Fabio Orsino, meeting one member of the family, stabbed him, and as a sign of the hatred they had sworn to one another, bathed his mouth and hands in the blood. The agitation in Rome was so great, that when the corpse of Alexander the Sixth was about to enter the church, there occurred a kind of panic, such as will suddenly arise in times of popular agitation, instantly causing so great a disturbance in the funeral cortege, that the guards drew up in battle array, the clergy fled into the sacristy, and the bearers dropped the bier. The people, tearing off the pall which covered it, disclosed the corpse, and every one could see with impunity and close at hand the man who, fifteen days before, had made princes, kings, and emperors tremble, from one end of the world to the other. But in accordance with that religious feeling towards death which all men instinctively feel, and which alone survives every other, even in the heart of the atheist, the bier was taken up again and carried to the foot of the great altar in St. Peter's, where, set on trestles, it was exposed to public view. But the body had become so black, so deformed and swollen, that it was horrible to behold. From its nose a bloody matter escaped, the mouth gaped hideously, and the tongue was so monstrously enlarged that it filled the whole cavity. To this frightful appearance was added a decomposition so great that, although at the Pope's funeral it is customary to kiss the hand which bore the fisherman's ring, not one approached to offer this mark of respect and religious reverence to the representative of God on earth. Towards seven o'clock in the evening, when the declining day adds so deep a melancholy to the silence of a church, four porters and two working carpenters carry the corpse into the chapel where it was to be interred, and, lifting it off the catafalque, where it lay in state, put it in the coffin which was to be its last abode. But it was found that the coffin was too short, and the body could not be got in till the legs were bent and thrust in with violent blows. Then the carpenters put on the lid, and while one of them sat on top to force the knees to bend, the others hammered in the nails. Amid those Shakespearean pleasantries, that sound as a last orison in the ear of the mighty, then, says Tommaso Tomasi, he was placed on the right of the great altar of St. Peter's, beneath a very ugly tomb. The next morning this epitaph was found inscribed upon the tomb. Vendit Alexander Claves, Altaria Christum, Emerat ile prius, Vendere Uc Potest. That is, Pope Alexander sold the Christ, the altars and the keys, but any one who buys a thing may sell it if he please. End of section 25six of celebrated crimes volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by anne boulet celebrated crimes volume one by alexander dumas translated by g b ives section twenty six the Borgias, chapter 15. From the effect produced at Rome by Alexander's death, one may imagine what happened not only in the whole of Italy, but also in the rest of the world. For a moment, Europe swayed, for the column which supported the vault of the political edifice had given way, and the star with eyes of flame and rays of blood, round which all things had revolved for the last eleven years, was now extinguished, and for a moment the world, on a sudden struck motionless, remained in silence and darkness. After the first moment of stupefaction, all who had an injury to avenge arose and hurried to the chase. Savorza retook Pizarro, Baglioni Perugia, Guido in Ubaldo Urbino, and La Roveri Sinagoglia. The Vitelli entered Citta di Castello, the Appiani Piombino, the Orsini Monte Giordano, and their other territories. The Romagna alone remained impassive and loyal, for the people, who have no concern with the quarrels of the great, 
provided they do not affect themselves, had never been so happy as under the government of Caesar. The Colanas were pledged to maintain a neutrality, and had been consequently restored to the possession of their castles, and the cities of Chuazano, Capodano, Frasgati, Rocca di Papa, and Nettuno, which they found in a better condition than when they had left them, as the Pope had had them embellished and fortified. Caesar was still in the Vatican with his troops, who, loyal to him in his misfortune, kept watch about the palace, where he was writhing on his bed of pain and roaring like a wounded lion. The cardinals, who had in their first terror fled, each his own way, instead of attending the Pope's obsequies, began to assemble once more, some at the Minerva, others around Cardinal Carafa. Frightened by the troops that Caesar still had, especially since the command was entrusted to Michelotto, they collected all the money they could to levy an army of 2,000 soldiers with. Charles Teneo at their head, with the title of captain of the Sacred College. It was then hoped that peace was re-established, when it was heard that Prospero Colonna was coming with 3,000 men from the side of Naples, and Fabio Orsino from the side of Viterbo with 200 horse and more than 1,000 infantry. Indeed, they entered Rome at only one day's interval one from another. By so similar an ardor were they inspired. Thus there were five armies in Rome, Caesar's army, holding the Vatican and the Borgo, the army of the Bishop of Nicastro, who had received from Alexander the guardianship of Castle Sant'Angelo, and had shut himself up there, refusing to yield, the army of the Sacred College, which was stationed round about the Minerva, the army of Prospero Colonna, which was encamped at the capital, and the army of Fabio Orsino, in barracks at the Ripetta. On their side, the Spaniards had advanced to Terracino and the French to Nepi. The cardinals saw that Rome now stood upon a mine which the least spark might cause to explode. They summoned the ambassadors of the Emperor of Germany, the kings of France and Spain, and the Republic of Venice to raise their voice in the name of their masters. The ambassadors, impressed with the urgency of the situation, began by declaring the sacred college inviolable. They then ordered the Orsini, the Colanas, and the Duke of Valentinois to leave Rome and go each his own way. The Orsini were the first to submit. The next morning their example was followed by the Colanas. No one was left but Caesar, who said he was willing to go, but desired to make his conditions beforehand. The Vatican was undermined, he declared, and if his demands were refused, he and those who came to take him should be blown up together. It was known that his were never empty threats they came to terms with. Caesar promised to remain ten miles away from Rome the whole time the conclave lasted, and not to take any action against the town or any other of the ecclesiastical states. Fabio Orsino and Prospero Colonna had made the same promises. It was agreed that Caesar should quit Rome with his army, artillery, and baggage, and to ensure his not being attacked or molested in the streets, the sacred college should add to his numbers 400 infantry, who, in case of attack or insult, would fight for him. The Venetian ambassador answered for the Orsini, the Spanish ambassador for the Colonnas, the ambassador of France for Caesar. At the day and hour appointed, Caesar sent out his artillery, which consisted of 18 pieces of cannon and 400 infantry of the sacred college, on each of whom he bestowed a ducat. Behind the artillery came a hundred chariots escorted by his advance guard. The duke was carried out of the gate of the Vatican. He lay on a bed covered with a scarlet canopy, supported by twelve halberdiers, leaning forward on his cushions so that no one might see his face, with its purple lips and bloodshot eyes. Beside him was his naked sword, to show that, feeble as he was, he could use it at need. His finest charger, caparisoned in black velvet embroidered with his arms, walked beside the bed, led by a page, so that Caesar could mount in case of surprise or attack. Before him and behind, both right and left, marched his army, their arms at rest, but without beating of drums or blowing of trumpets. This gave a somber funereal air to the whole procession, which at the gate of the city met Prospero Colonna awaiting it with a considerable band of men. 
Caesar thought at first that, breaking his word as he had so often done himself, Prospero Colonna was going to attack him. He ordered a halt, and prepared to mount his horse. But Prospero Colonna, seeing the state he was in, advanced to his bedside alone. He came, against expectation, to offer him an escort, fearing an ambuscade on the part of Fabio Orsino, who had loudly sworn that he would lose his honor or avenge the death of Paolo Orsina, his father. Caesar thanked Colonna, and replied that from the moment that Orsini stood alone, he ceased to fear him. Then Colonna saluted the duke, and rejoined his men, directing them towards Albano, while Caesar took the road to Cita Castellana, which had remained loyal. When there, Caesar found himself not only master of his own fate, but of others as well. Of the twenty-two votes he owned in the sacred college, twelve had remained faithful, and as the conclave was composed in all of thirty-seven cardinals, he with his twelve votes could make the majority inclined to whichever side he chose. Accordingly, he was courted both by the Spanish and the French party, each desiring the election of a pope of their own nation. Caesar listened, promising nothing and refusing nothing. He gave his twelve votes to Francesco Piccolomini, Cardinal of Siena, one of his father's creatures who had remained his friend, and the latter was elected on the 8th of October and took the name of Pius the Third. Caesar's hopes did not deceive him. Pius the Third was hardly elected before he sent him a safe conduct to Rome. The Duke came back with 250 men at arms, 250 light horse, and 800 infantry, and lodged in his palace, the soldiers camping round about. Meanwhile the Orsini, pursuing their projects of vengeance against Caesar, had been levying many troops at Perugia, and the neighborhood to bring against him to Rome, as they fancied that France, in whose service they were engaged, was humoring the duke for the sake of the twelve votes, which were wanted to secure the election of Cardinal Amboise at the next conclave, they went over to the service of Spain. Meanwhile, Caesar was signing a new treaty with Louis the Twelfth, by which he engaged to support him with all his forces, and even with his person, so soon as he could ride, in maintaining his conquest of Naples. Louis, on his side, guaranteed that he should retain the possession of the states he still held, and promised his help in recovering those he had lost. The day when this treaty was made known, Gonzalvo de Cordova proclaimed to the sound of a trumpet in all the streets of Rome that every Spanish subject serving in a foreign army was at once to break his engagement on pain of being found guilty of high treason. This measure robbed Caesar of ten or twelve of his best officers and of nearly three hundred men. Then the Orsini, seeing his army thus reduced, entered Rome, supported by the Spanish ambassador, and summoned Caesar to appear before the Pope and the Sacred College, and give an account of his crimes. Faithful to his engagements, Pius III replied that in his quality of sovereign prince, the Duke in his temporal administration was quite independent and was answerable for his actions to God alone. But as the Pope felt he could not much longer support Caesar against his enemies for all his good will, he advised him to try to join the French army, which was still advancing on Naples, in the midst of which he would alone find safety. Caesar resolved to retire to Bracciano, where Gian Giordano Orsino, who had once gone with him to France, and who was the only member of the family who had not declared against him, offered him an asylum in the name of Cardinal Dumest. So one morning he offered his troops to march for this town, and, taking his place in their midst, he left Rome. But though Caesar had kept his intentions quiet, the Orsini had been forewarned, and, taking out all the troops they had by the gate of San Pacuccio, they had made a long detour and blocked Caesar's way. So when the latter arrived at Storta, he found the Orsini's army drawn up awaiting him in numbers exceeding his own by at least one half. Caesar saw that to come to blows in his then feeble state was to rush on certain destruction. So he ordered his troops to retire, and, being a first-rate strategist, echeloned his retreat so skillfully that his enemies, though they followed, dared not attack him, and he re-entered the pontifical town without the loss of a single man. This time Caesar went straight to the Vatican, to put himself more directly under the Pope's protection. 
he distributed his soldiers about the palace so as to guard all its exits now the orsini resolved to make an end of caesar had determined to attack him wheresoever he might be with no regard to the sanctity of the place this they attempted but without success as caesar's men kept a good guard on every side and offered a strong defence then the orsini not being able to force the guard of the castle sant'angelo hoped to succeed better with the duke by leaving rome and then returning by the torriani gate but caesar anticipated this move and they found the gate guarded and barricaded none the less they pursued their design seeking by open violence the vengeance they had hoped to obtain by craft and having surprised the approaches to the gate set fire to it a passage gained they made their way into the gardens of the castle where they found caesar awaiting them at the head of his cavalry face to face with danger the duke had found his old strength and he was the first to rush upon his enemies loudly challenging orsino in the hope of killing him should they meet but either orsino did not hear him or dared not fight and after an exciting contest caesar who was numerically two-thirds weaker than his enemy saw his cavalry cut to pieces and after performing miracles of personal strength and courage was obliged to return to the vatican there he found the pope in mortal agony the orsini tired of contending against the old man's word of honor pledged to the duke had by the interposition of pandolfo petrucci gained the ear of the pope's surgeon who placed a poison plaster upon a wound in his leg the pope then was actually dying when caesar covered with dust and blood entered his room pursued by his enemies who knew no check till they reached the palace walls behind which the remnant of his army still held their ground pius the third who knew he was about to die sat up in his bed gave caesar the key of the corridor which led to the castle sant'angelo and an order addressed to the governor to admit him and his family to defend him to the last extremity and to let him go wherever he thought fit and then fell fainting on his bed caesar took his two daughters by the hand and followed by the little dukes of sermonetta and nepi took refuge in the last asylum open to him the same night the pope died he had reigned only twenty-six days after his death caesar who had cast himself fully dressed upon his bed heard his door open at two o'clock in the morning not knowing what any one might want of him at such an hour he raised himself on one elbow and felt for the handle of his sword with his other hand but at first glance he recognized his nocturnal visitor giuliano de la rovere utterly exhausted by the poison abandoned by his troops fallen as he was from the height of his power caesar who could now do nothing for himself could yet make a pope giuliano della rovere had come to buy the votes of his twelve cardinals caesar imposed his conditions which were accepted if elected giuliano della rovere was to help caesar to recover his territories in romagna caesar was to remain general of the church and francesco maria della rovere prefect of rome was to marry one of caesar's daughters on these conditions caesar sold his twelve cardinals to giuliano the next day at giuliano's request the sacred college ordered the orsini to leave rome for the whole time occupied by the conclave on the thirty first of october fifteen o three at the first scrutiny giuliano de la rovere was elected pope and took the name of julius the second he was scarcely installed in the vatican when he made it his first care to summon caesar and give him his former rooms there then since the duke was fully restored to health he began to busy himself with the re-establishment of his affairs which had suffered sadly of late the defeat of his army and his own escape to sant'angelo where he was supposed to be a prisoner had brought about great changes in romagna cesena was once more in the power of the church as formerly it had been gian savorza had again entered pizarro ordelafi had seized forli malatesta was laying claim to rimini the inhabitants of imola had assassinated their governor and the town was divided between two opinions one that it should be put into the hands of the riani the other into the hands of the church fanza had remained loyal longer than any other place but at last losing hope of seeing caesar recover his power it had summoned francesco 
a natural son of Galeotto Manfredi, the last surviving heir of this unhappy family, all whose legitimate descendants had been massacred by Borgia. It is true that the fortresses of these different places had taken no part in these revolutions, and had remained immutably faithful to the Duke of Valentinois. So it was not precisely the defection of these towns, which, thanks to their fortresses, might be reconquered, that was the cause of uneasiness to Caesar and Julius the Second. It was the difficult situation that Venice had thrust upon them. Venice, in the spring of the same year, had signed a treaty of peace with the Turks. Thus set free from her eternal enemy, she had just led her forces to the Romagna, which she had always coveted. These troops had been led towards Ravenna, the farthermost limit of the papal estates, and put under the command of Giacomo Venieri, who had failed to capture Cassena, and had only failed through the courage of its inhabitants. But this check had been amply compensated by the surrender of the fortresses of Val di Lamani and Fainza, by the capture of Farlim Popoli, and the surrender of Rimini, which Pandolfo Malatesta, its lord, exchanged for the sovereignty of Cittadella, in the state of Padua, and for the rank of gentlemen of Venice. Then Caesar made a proposition to Julius the Second. This was to make a momentary secession to the church of his own estates in Romagna, so that the respect felt by the Venetians for the church might save these towns from their aggressors. But, says Gucciardini, Julius the Second, whose ambition, so natural in sovereign leaders, had not yet extinguished the remains of rectitude, refused to accept the places, afraid of exposing himself to the temptation of keeping them later on, against his promises. But as the case was urgent, he proposed to Caesar that he should leave Rome, embark at Ostia, and cross over to Spezia, where Michelotto was to meet him at the head of one hundred men-at-arms and one hundred light horse, the only remnant of his magnificent army, thence by land to Ferrara, and from Ferrara to Imala, where, once arrived, he could utter his war cry so loud that it would be heard through the length and breadth of Romagna. This advice being after Caesar's own heart, he accepted it at once. The resolution submitted to the sacred college was approved, and Caesar left for Ostia, accompanied by Bartolomeo de la Rovere, nephew of his holiness. Caesar at last felt he was free, and fancied himself already on his good charger, a second time carrying war into all the places where he had formerly fought. When he reached Ostia, he was met by the cardinals of Sorrento and Volterra, who came in the name of Julius II to ask him to give up the very same citadels which he had refused three days before. The fact was that the Pope had learned in the interim that the Venetians had made fresh aggressions, and recognized that the method proposed by Caesar was the only one that would check them. But this time it was Caesar's turn to refuse, for he was weary of these tergiversations and feared a trap. So he said that the surrender asked for would be useless, since by God's help he should be in Romagna before eight days were passed. So the cardinals of Sorrento and Volterra returned to Rome with a refusal. The next morning, just as Caesar was setting foot on his vessel, he was arrested in the name of Julius the Second. He thought at first that this was the end. He was used to this mode of action, and knew how short was the space between a prison and a tomb. The matter was all the easier in his case, because the Pope, if he chose, would have plenty of pretext for making a case against him. But the heart of Julius was of another kind from his, swift to anger but open to clemency. So, when the Duke came back to Rome guarded, the momentary irritation his refusal had caused was already calmed, and the Pope received him in his usual fashion at his palace, and with his ordinary courtesy, although from the beginning it was easy for the Duke to see that he was being watched. In return for this kind of reception, Caesar consented to yield the fortress of Cassena to the Pope, as being a town which had once belonged to the church, and now should return, giving the deed, signed by Caesar, to one of his captains, called Pietro de Oviedo, he ordered him to take possession of the fortress in the name of the Holy See. Pietro obeyed, and starting at once for Cassena, presented himself armed with his warrant before Don Diego Chinon, a noble condottieri of Spain, who was holding the fortress in Caesar's name. But when he had read over the paper that Pietro de Oviedo brought, 
Don Diego replied that as he knew his lord and master was a prisoner, it would be disgraceful in him to obey an order that had probably been wrested from him by violence, and that the bearer deserved to die for undertaking such a cowardly office. He therefore bade his soldiers seize de Oviedo, and flung him down from the top of the walls. This sentence was promptly executed. This mark of fidelity might have proved fatal to Caesar. When the Pope heard how his messenger had been treated, he flew into such a rage that the prisoner thought a second time that his hour was come, and in order to receive his liberty, he made the first of those new propositions to Julius the Second, which were drawn up in the form of a treaty and sanctioned by a bull. By these arrangements, the Duke of Valentinois was bound to hand over to His Holiness, within the space of forty days, the fortresses of Cassena and Bertinoro, and authorized the surrender of Forli. This arrangement was guaranteed by two bankers in Rome who were responsible for 15,000 ducats, the sum total of the expenses which the governor pretended he had incurred in the place on the duke's account. The pope, on his part, engaged to send Caesar to Ostia, under the sole guard of the cardinal of Santa Croce and two officers, who were to give him his full liberty on the very day when his engagements were fulfilled. Should this not happen, Caesar was to be taken to Rome and imprisoned in the castle of St. Angelo. In fulfillment of this treaty, Caesar went down the Tiber as far as Ostia, accompanied by the Pope's treasurer and many of his servants. The Cardinal of Santa Croce followed, and the next day joined him there. But as Caesar feared that Julius II might keep him a prisoner, in spite of his pledge word after he had yielded up the fortresses, he asked, through the mediation of Cardinals Borgia and Remolina, who, not feeling safe at Rome, had retired to Naples, for a safe conduct to Gonzalvo of Cordova, and for two ships to take him there. With the return of the courier the safe conduct arrived, announcing that the ships would shortly follow. In the midst of all this, the Cardinal of Santa Croce, learning that by the duke's orders the governors of Cassena and Bertinoro had surrendered their fortresses to the captains of his holiness relaxed his rigor and knowing that his prisoner would some day or other be free began to let him go out without a guard then caesar feeling some fear lest when he started with gonzalvo's ships the same thing might happen as on the occasion of his embarking on the pope's vessel that is that he might be arrested a second time concealed himself in a house outside the town and when night came on mounting a wretched horse that belonged to a peasant rode as far as Neptuno and there hired a little boat in which he embarked for monte dragone and thence gained naples gonzalvo received him with such joy that caesar was deceived as to his intention and this time believed that he was really saved his confidence was redoubled when opening his designs to gonzalvo and telling him that he counted upon gaining Pisa and thence going on into Romagna. Gonzalva allowed him to recruit as many soldiers at Naples as he pleased, promising him two ships to embark with. Caesar, deceived by these appearances, stopped nearly six weeks at Naples, every day seeing the Spanish governor and discussing his plans. But Gonzalvo was only waiting to gain time to tell the king of Spain that his enemy was in his hands, and Caesar actually went to the castle to bid Gonzalvo goodbye, thinking he was about to start after he had embarked his men on the two ships. The Spanish governor received him with his accustomed courtesy, wished him every kind of prosperity, and embraced him as he left. But at the door of the castle, Caesar found one of Gonzalvo's captains, Nuno Capahea by name, who arrested him as a prisoner of Ferdinand the Catholic. Caesar at these words heaved a deep sigh, cursing the ill luck that had made him trust the word of an enemy when he had so often broken his own. He was at once taken to the castle, where the prison gate closed behind him, and he felt no hope that any one would come to his aid, for the only being who was devoted to him in this world was Michelotto, and he had heard that Michelotto had been arrested near Pisa by order of Julius the Second. While Caesar was being taken to prison, an officer came to him to deprive him of the safe conduct given him by Gonzalvo. The day after his arrest, which occurred on the 27th of May, 1504, Caesar was taken aboard a ship, which at once weighed anchor and set sail for Spain. During the whole voyage he had but one page to serve him, and as soon as he disembarked he was taken to the castle of Medina del Campo. Ten years later, Gonzalvo, who at that time was himself proscribed, 
owned to Loxa on his dying bed that now, when he was to appear in the presence of God, two things weighed cruelly on his conscience. One was his treason to Ferdinand, the other his breach of faith towards Caesar. End of section 26「Section 27 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1, by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 27. The Borgias. Chapter 16 Cesar was in prison for two years, always hoping that Louis the Twelfth would reclaim him as peer of the kingdom of France. But Louis, much disturbed by the loss of the battle of Garigliano, which robbed him of the kingdom of Naples, had enough to do with his own affairs without busying himself with his cousins. So the prisoner was beginning to despair, when one day, as he broke his bread at breakfast, he found a file and a little bottle containing a narcotic, with a letter from Michelotto, saying that he was out of prison and had left Italy for Spain, and now lay in hiding with the Count of Benevento in the neighboring village. He added that from the next day forward he and the Count would wait every night on the road between the fortress and the village with three excellent horses. It was now Cesar's part to do the best he could with his bottle and file. When the whole world had abandoned the Duke of Romagna, he had been remembered by a Sbirro. The prison where he had been shut up for two years was so hateful to Cesar that he lost not a single moment. The same day he attacked one of the bars of a window that looked out upon an inner court, and soon contrived so to manipulate it that it would need only a final push to come out. But not only was the window nearly seventy feet from the ground, but one could only get out of the court by using an exit reserved for the governor, of which he alone had the key. Also this key never left him. By day it hung at his waist. By night it was under his pillow. This, then, was the chief difficulty. But, prisoner though he was, Cesar had always been treated with the respect due to his name and rank. Every day at the dinner hour he was conducted from the room that served as his prison to the governor, who did the honors of the table in a grand and courteous fashion. The fact was that Don Manuel had served with honor under King Ferdinand, and therefore, while he guarded Cesar rigorously according to orders, he had a great respect for so brave a general, and took pleasure in listening to the accounts of his battles. So he had often insisted that Cesar should not only dine, but also breakfast with him. Happily the prisoner, yielding perhaps to some presentiment, had till now refused this favor. This was of great advantage to him, since, thanks to his solitude, he had been able to receive the instruments of escape sent by Michelotto. The same day he received them, Cesar, on going back to his room, made a false step and sprained his foot. At the dinner hour he tried to go down, but pretended to be suffering so cruelly that he gave it up. The governor came to see him in his room and found him stretched upon the bed. The day after he was no better. The governor had his dinner sent in, and came to see him as on the night before. He found his prisoner so dejected and gloomy in his solitude that he offered to come and sup with him. Cesar gratefully accepted. This time it was the prisoner who did the honors. Cesar was charmingly courteous. The governor thought he would profit by this lack of restraint to put to him certain questions as to the manner of his arrest, and asked him, as an old Castilian, for whom honor is still of some account, what the truth really was as to Gonzalvo's and Ferdinand's breach of faith with him. Cesar appeared extremely inclined to give him his entire confidence, but showed by a sign that the attendants were in the way. 
This precaution appeared quite natural, and the governor took no offence, but hastened to send them all away, so as to be the sooner alone with his companion. When the door was shut, Caesar filled his glass and the governor's, proposing the king's health. The governor honoured the toast. Caesar at once began his tale, but he had scarcely uttered a third part of it when, interesting as it was, the eyes of his host shut as though by magic, and he slid under the table in a profound sleep. After half an hour had passed, the servants, hearing no noise, entered and found the two, one on the table, the other under it. This event was not so extraordinary that they paid any great attention to it. All they did was to carry Don Manuel to his room and lift Cesar on the bed. Then they put away the remnant of the meal for the next day's supper, shut the door very carefully, and left their prisoner alone. Cesar stayed for a minute motionless, and apparently plunged in the deepest sleep, but when he heard the steps retreating, he quietly raised his head, opened his eyes, slipped off the bed, walked to the door, slowly indeed, but not to all appearance feeling the accident of the night before, and applied his ear for some minutes to the keyhole. Then, lifting his head with an expression of indescribable pride, he wiped his brow with his hand, and for the first time since his guards went out, breathed freely with full-drawn breaths. There was no time to lose. His first care was to shut the door as securely on the inside as it was already shut on the outside, to blow out the lamp, to open the window, and to finish sawing through the bar. When this was done, he undid the bandages on his leg, took down the window and bed curtains, tore them into strips, joined the sheets, table napkins, and cloth, and with all these things tied together end to end, formed a rope fifty or sixty feet long, with knots every here and there. This rope he fixed securely to the bar next to the one he had just cut through, then he climbed up to the window and began what was really the hardest part of his perilous enterprise, clinging with hands and feet to this fragile support. Luckily he was both strong and skillful, and he went down the whole length of the rope without accident. But when he reached the end, and was hanging on the last knot, he sought in vain to touch the ground with his feet. His rope was too short." The situation was a terrible one. The darkness of the night prevented the fugitive from seeing how far off he was from the ground, and his fatigue prevented him from even attempting to climb up again. Cesar put up a brief prayer, whether to God or Satan, he alone could say. Then, letting go the rope, he dropped from a height of twelve or fifteen feet. The danger was too great for the fugitive to trouble about a few trifling contusions. He at once rose, and guiding himself by the direction of his window, he went straight to the little door of exit. He then put his hand into the pocket of his doublet, and a cold sweat damped his brow. Either he had forgotten and left it in his room, or had lost it in his fall. Anyhow, he had not the key." but summoning his recollections he quite gave up the first idea for the second, which was the only likely one. Again he crossed the court, looking for the place where the key might have fallen, by the aid of the wall round a tank on which he had laid his hand when he got up. But the object of search was so small, and the night so dark, that there was little chance of getting any result. Still Cesar sought for it, for in this key was his last hope. Suddenly a door was opened, and a night watch appeared, preceded by two torches. Cesar for the moment thought he was lost, but remembering the tank behind him he dropped into it, and with nothing but his head above water, anxiously watched the movements of the soldiers as they advanced beside him, passed only a few feet away, crossed the court, and then disappeared by an opposite door. But short as their luminous apparition had been, it had lighted up the ground, and Cesar, by the glare of the torches, had caught the glitter of the long-sought key. And as soon as the door was shut behind the men, 
was again master of his liberty. Halfway between the castle and the village, two cavaliers and a led horse were waiting for him. The two men were Michelotto and the Count of Benevento. Cesar sprang upon the riderless horse, pressed with fervor the hand of the Count and the Sbirro, then all three galloped to the frontier of Navarre, where they arrived three days later, and were honorably received by the king, Jean d'Albret, the brother of Cesar's wife. From Navarre he thought to pass into France, and from France to make an attempt upon Italy with the aid of Louis the Twelfth. But during Cesar's detention in the castle of Medina del Campo, Louis had made peace with the king of Spain, and when he heard of Cesar's flight, instead of helping him, as there was some reason to expect he would, since he was a relative by marriage, he took away the duchy of Valentinois and also his pension. Still, Cesar had nearly two hundred thousand ducats in the charge of bankers at Genoa. He wrote asking for this sum, with which he hoped to levy troops in Spain and in Navarre, and make an attempt upon Pisa. Five hundred men, two hundred thousand ducats, his name and his word, were more than enough to save him from despair. The bankers denied the deposit. Cesar was at the mercy of his brother-in-law. One of the vassals of the King of Navarre, named Prince Alarino, had just then revolted. Cesar then took command of the army which Jean d'Albret was sending out against him, followed by Michelotto, who was as faithful in adversity as ever before. Thanks to Cesar's courage and skilful tactics, Prince Alarino was beaten in a first encounter but the day after his defeat he rallied his army, and offered battle about three o'clock in the afternoon. Cesar accepted it. For nearly four hours they fought obstinately on both sides, but at length, as the day was going down, Cesar proposed to decide the issue by making a charge himself, at the head of a hundred men-at-arms, upon a body of cavalry which made his adversary's chief force. To his great astonishment, this cavalry at the first shock gave way and took flight in the direction of a little wood, where they seemed to be seeking refuge. Cesar followed close on their heels up to the edge of the forest. Then suddenly the pursued turned right about face, three or four hundred archers came out of the wood to help them, and Cesar's men, seeing that they had fallen into an ambush, took to their heels like cowards, and abandoned their leader. Left alone, Cesar would not budge one step. Possibly he had had enough of life, and his heroism was rather the result of satiety than courage. However that may be, he defended himself like a lion, but riddled with arrows and bolts, his horse at last fell, with Cesar's leg under him. His adversaries rushed upon him, and one of them thrusting a sharp and slender iron pike through a weak place in his armor, pierced his breast. Cesar cursed God and died. But the rest of the enemy's army was defeated thanks to the courage of Michelotto, who fought like a valiant condottiere, but learned on returning to the camp in the evening from those who had fled that they had abandoned Cesar, and that he had never reappeared. Then only too certain from his master's well-known courage that disaster had occurred, he desired to give one last proof of his devotion by not leaving his body to the wolves and birds of prey. Torches were lighted, for it was dark, and with ten or twelve of those who had gone with Cesar as far as the little wood, he went to seek his master. On reaching the spot they pointed out, he beheld five men stretched side by side. Four of them were dressed, but the fifth had been stripped of his clothing and lay completely naked. Michelotto dismounted, lifted the head upon his knees, and by the light of the torches recognized Cesar. Thus fell, on the 10th of March, 1507, on an unknown field near an obscure village called Vian, in a wretched skirmish with the vassal of a petty king, the man whom Machiavelli presents to all princes as the model of ability, devotion.
diplomacy, and courage. As to Lucrezia, the fair Duchess of Ferrara, she died full of years and honors, adored as a queen by her subjects, and sung as a goddess by Ariosto and by Bembo. End of section 27《Of Celebrated Crimes》Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Celebrated Crimes》Volume One by Alexander Dumas, translated by G. B. Ives. Section twenty-eight. Epilogue. There was once in Paris, says Boccaccio, a brave and good merchant named Jean de Sivigny who did a great trade in drapery, and was connected in business with a neighbor and fellow merchant, a very rich man called Abraham, who, though a Jew, enjoyed a good reputation. Jean de Sivigny, appreciating the qualities of the worthy Israelite, feared lest, good man as he was, his false religion would bring his soul straight to eternal perdition, so he began to urge him, gently as a friend, to renounce his errors and open his eyes to the Christian faith which he could see for himself was prospering and spreading day by day, being the only true and good religion, whereas his own creed, it was very plain, was so quickly diminishing that it would soon disappear from the face of the earth. The Jew replied that except in his own religion there was no salvation, that he was born in it, proposed to live and die in it, and that he knew nothing in the world that could change his opinion. Still, in his proselytizing fervor, Jean would not think himself beaten, and never a day passed but he demonstrated with those fair words the merchant uses to seduce a customer, the superiority of the Christian religion above the Jewish, and although Abraham was a great master of Mosaic law, he began to enjoy his friend's preaching, either because of the friendship he felt for him, or because the Holy Ghost descended upon the tongue of the new apostle. Still obstinate in his own belief, he would not change. The more he persisted in his error, the more excited was Jean about converting him, so that at last, by God's help, being somewhat shaken by his friend's urgency, Abraham one day said, "'Listen, Jean, since you have it so much at heart that I should be converted, behold me disposed to satisfy you. But before I go to Rome to see him who you call God's vicar on earth, I must study his manner of life and his morals, as also those of his brethren, the cardinals.' And if, as I doubt not, they are in harmony with what you preach, I will admit that, as you have taken such pains to show me, your faith is better than mine, and I will do as you desire. But if I should prove otherwise, I shall remain a Jew, as I was before, for it is not worth while at my age to change my belief for a worse one. Jean was very sad when he heard these words, and he was mournful to himself. Now I have lost my time and pains, which I thought I had spent so well when I was hoping to convert this unhappy Abraham, for if he unfortunately goes, as he says he will, to the court of Rome, and there sees the shameful life led by the servants of the church, instead of becoming a Christian, the Jew will be more of a Jew than ever. Then turning to Abraham, he said, Ah, friend, why do you wish to incur such fatigue and expense by going to Rome, besides the fact that travelling by sea or by land must be very dangerous for so rich a man as you are. Do you suppose there is no one here to baptize you? If you have any doubts concerning the faith I have expounded, where better than here will you find theologians capable of contending with them and allaying them? So, you see, this voyage seems to me quite unnecessary. Just imagine that the priests there are such as you see here, and all the better in that they are nearer to the supreme pastor." If you are guided by my advice, you will postpone this toil till you have committed some grave sin and need absolution. Then you and I will go together. But the Jew replied, I believe, dear Jean, that everything is as you tell me, but you know how obstinate I am. I will go to Rome, or I will never be a Christian. Then Jean, seeing his great wish, resolved that it was no use trying to thwart him, and wished him good luck but in his heart he gave up all hope, for it was certain that his friend would come back from his pilgrimage more of a Jew than ever, if the court of Rome was still as he had seen it. 
But Abraham mounted his horse, and at his best speed took the road to Rome, where, on his arrival, he was wonderfully well received by his co-religionists, and after staying there a good long time, he began to study the behavior of the Pope, the cardinals, and other prelates, and of the whole court. But much to his surprise he found out, partly by what passed under his eyes, and partly by what he was told, that all from the Pope downward to the lowest sacristan of St. Peter's were committing the sins of luxurious living in a most disgraceful and unbridled manner, with no remorse and no shame, so that pretty women and handsome youths could obtain any favours they pleased. In addition to this sensuality which they exhibited in public, he saw that they were gluttons and drunkards, so much so that they were more the slaves of the belly than are the greediest of animals. When he looked a little further, he found them so avaricious and fond of money that they sold for hard cash both human bodies and divine offices, and with less conscience than a man in Paris would sell cloth or any other merchandise. Seeing this, and much more that it would not be proper to set down here, it seemed to Abraham, himself a chaste, sober, and upright man, that he had seen enough. So he resolved to return to Paris, and carried out the resolution with his usual promptitude. Jean de Sivinchy held a great fete in honour of his return, although he had lost hope of his coming back converted. But he left time for him to settle down before he spoke of anything, thinking there would be plenty of time to hear the bad news he expected. But, after a few days of rest, Abraham himself came to see his friend, and Jean ventured to ask what he thought of the Holy Father, the cardinals, and the other persons at the pontifical court. At these words the Jew exclaimed, "'God damn them all! I never once succeeded in finding among them any holiness, any devotion, any good works, but, on the contrary, luxurious living, avarice, greed, fraud, envy, pride, and even worse, if there is worse, all the machine seemed to be set in motion by an impulse less divine than diabolical. After what I saw, it is my firm conviction that your Pope, and of course the others as well, are using all their talents, art, endeavors to banish the Christian religion from the face of the earth, though they ought to be its foundation and support. And since, in spite of all the care and trouble they expend to arrive at this end, I see that your religion is spreading every day and becoming more brilliant and more pure. It is borne in upon me that the Holy Spirit himself protects it as the only true and the most holy religion. This is why, deaf as you found me to your counsel and rebellious to your wish, I am now, ever since I returned from this Sodom, firmly resolved on becoming a Christian. So let us go at once to the church, for I am quite ready to be baptized. There is no need to say if Jean de Sivangy, who expected a refusal, was pleased at this consent. Without delay he went with his godson to Notre Dame de Paris, where he prayed the first priest he met to administer baptism to his friend, and this was speedily done, and the new convert changed his Jewish name of Abraham into the Christian name of Jean, and as the neophyte, thanks to his journey to Rome, had gained a profound belief, his natural good qualities increased so greatly in the practice of our holy religion, that after leading an exemplary life he died in the full order of sanctity. This tale of Boccaccio's gives so admirable an answer to the charge of irreligion which some might make against us if they mistook our intentions, that, as we shall not offer any other reply, we have not hesitated to present it entire as it stands to the eyes of our readers. And let us never forget that if the papacy has had an innocent eighth and an Alexander VI, who are in its shame, it also has a pious, and a Gregory XVI, who are in its honour and glory. End of section 28twenty nine of celebrated crimes volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by miriam esther goldman celebrated crimes volume one by alexander dumas translated by g b ives section twenty nine 
The Chenchi Part 1 The Chenchi, 1598 By Alexandre Dumas, Père Should you ever go to Rome and visit the Villa Pamphili, no doubt, after having sought under its tall pines and along its canal the shade and freshness so rare in the capital of the Christian world, you will descend towards the Gianniculum Hill by a charming road, in the middle of which you will find the Pauline Fountain. Having passed this monument, and having lingered a moment on the terrace of the Church of St. Peter Montorio, which commands the whole of Rome, you will find the cloister of Bramante, in the middle of which, sunk a few feet below the level, is built, on the identical place where St. Peter was crucified, a little temple, half Greek, half Christian. You will thence ascend by a side door into the church itself. There the attentive Cicerone will show you, in the first chapel to the right, the Christ Scourged, by Sebastian del Piombo, and in the third chapel to the left, an entombment by Fiammingo. Having examined these two masterpieces at leisure, he will take you to each end of the transverse cross, and will show you on one side a picture by Salviati on slate, and on the other a work by Vasari, then pointing out in melancholy tones a copy of Guido's martyrdom of St. Peter on the high altar, he will relate to you how, for three centuries, the divine Raphael's transfiguration was worshipped in that spot, how it was carried away by the French in 1809, and restored to the Pope by the Allies in 1814. As you have already in all probability admired this masterpiece in the Vatican, Allow him to expatiate and search at the foot of the altar for a mortuary slab, which you will identify by a cross and a single word, Orati. Under this gravestone is buried Beatrice Cenci, whose tragical story cannot but impress you profoundly. She was the daughter of Francesco Cenci. Whether or not it be true that men are born in harmony with their epoch, and that some embody its good qualities and others its bad ones, it may nevertheless interest our readers to cast a rapid glance over the period which had just passed when the events which we are about to relate took place. Francesco Cenci will then appear to them as the diabolical incarnation of his time. On the 11th of August, 1492, after the lingering death agony of Innocent the Eighth, during which two hundred and twenty murders were committed in the streets of Rome, Alexander the Sixth ascended to the pontifical throne. Son of a sister of Pope Calixtus the Third, Rodrigo Lenzuoli Borgia, before being created cardinal, had five children by Rosa Venozza, whom he afterwards caused to be married to a rich Roman. These children were Francis, Duke of Gandia, Caesar, Bishop and Cardinal, afterwards Duke of Valentinois, Lucrezia, who was married four times. Her first husband was Giovanni Sforza, lord of Pesaro, whom she left owing to his impotence. The second, Alfonso, duke of Basilia, whom her brother Caesar caused to be assassinated. The third, Alfonso de Este, duke of Ferrara, from whom a second divorce separated her. Finally, the fourth, Alfonso of Aragon, who was stabbed to death on the steps of the Basilica of St. Peter, and afterwards, three weeks later, strangled because he did not die soon enough from his wounds, which nevertheless were mortal. Geoffrey, Count of Squillace, of whom little is known, and finally a youngest son, of whom nothing at all is known. The most famous of these three brothers was Caesar Borgia. He had made every arrangement a plotter could make to be king of Italy at the death of his father the Pope, and his measures were so carefully taken as to leave no doubt in his own mind as to the success of this vast project. Every chance was provided against except one, but Satan himself could hardly have foreseen this particular one. The reader will judge for himself. The Pope had invited Cardinal Adrian to supper in his vineyard on the Belvedere. Cardinal Adrian was very rich, and the Pope wished to inherit his wealth, as he already had acquired that of the cardinals of Sant'Angelo, Capua, and Modena. To effect this, 
Caesar Borgia sent two bottles of poisoned wine to his father's cupbearer without taking him into his confidence. He only instructed him not to serve this wine till he himself gave orders to do so. Unfortunately, during supper, the cupbearer left his post for a moment, and in this interval, the careless butler served the poisoned wine to the Pope, to Caesar Borgia, and to Cardinal Cornetto. Alexander the Sixth died some hours afterwards. Caesar Borgia was confined to bed and sloughed off his skin, while Cardinal Cornetto lost his sight and his senses and was brought to death's door. Pius the Third succeeded Alexander the Sixth and reigned twenty-five days. On the twenty-sixth, he was poisoned also. Caesar Borgia had under his control eighteen Spanish cardinals who owed to them their places in the sacred college. These cardinals were entirely his creatures, and he could command them absolutely. As he was in a moribund condition and could make no use of them for himself, he sold them to Giuliano della Rovere, and Giuliano della Rovere was elected Pope under the name of Julius the Second. To the Rome of Nero succeeded the Athens of Pericles. Leo X succeeded Julius the Second, and under his pontificate Christianity assumed a pagan character, which, passing from art into manners, gives to this epoch a strange complexion. Crimes for the moment disappeared to give place to vices, but to charming vices, vices in good taste, such as those indulged in by Alcibiades and sung by Catullus. Leo X died after having assembled under his reign, which lasted eight years, eight months, and nineteen days, Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci, Correggio, Titian, Andrea del Sarto, Fra Bartolomeo, Giulio Romano, Ariosto, Giuciardini, and Machiavelli. Giulio di Medici and Pompeo Colonna were again rival candidates. Intrigues recommenced, and the conclave was once more so divided that at one time the cardinals thought they could only escape the difficulty in which they were placed by doing what they had done before, and electing a third competitor. They were even talking about Cardinal Orsini, when Giulio de Medici, one of the rival candidates, hit upon a very ingenious expedient. He wanted only five votes. Five of his partisans each offered to bet five of Colonna's a hundred thousand ducats to ten thousand against the election of Giulio de Medici. At the very first ballot after the wager, Giulio de Medici got the five votes he wanted. No objection could be made. The cardinals had not been bribed. They had made a bet. That was all. Thus it happened. On the 18th of November, 1523, Giulio de' Medici was proclaimed Pope under the name of Clement the Seventh. That same day, he generously paid the 500,000 ducats which his five partisans had lost. It was under this pontificate, and during the seven months in which Rome, conquered by the Lutheran soldiers of the Constable of Bourbon, saw holy things subjected to the most frightful profanations, that Francesco Cenci was born. He was the son of Monsignor Niccolo Cenci, afterwards an apostolic treasurer during the pontificate of Pius V. Under this venerable prelate, who occupied himself much more with the spiritual than the temporal administration of his kingdom, Niccolo Cenci took advantage of his spiritual head's abstraction of worldly matters to amass a net revenue of a hundred and sixty thousand piastres, about thirty-two thousand pounds of our money. Francesco Cenci, who was his only son, inherited this fortune. His youth was spent under popes so occupied with the schism of Luther that they had no time to think of anything else. The result was that Francesco Cenci, inheriting vicious instincts, and master of an immense fortune which enabled him to purchase immunity, abandoned himself to all the evil passions of his fiery and passionate temperament. Five times during his profligate career, imprisoned for abominable crimes, he only succeeded in procuring his liberation by the payment of two hundred thousand piastres, or about one million francs. 
it should be explained that popes at this time were in great need of money. The lawless profligacy of Francesco Cenci first began seriously to attract public attention under the pontificate of Gregory the Thirteenth. This reign offered marvelous facilities for the development of a reputation such as that which this reckless Italian Don Juan seemed bent on acquiring. Under the Bolognese Bon Campo, a free hand was given to those able to pay both assassins and judges. Rape and murder were so common that public justice scarcely troubled itself with these trifling things if nobody appeared to prosecute the guilty parties. The good Gregory had his reward for his easy-going indulgence. He was spared to rejoice over the massacre of St. Bartholomew. Francesco Cenci was at the time of which we are speaking, a man of forty-four, forty-five years of age, about five feet four inches in height, symmetrically proportioned and very strong, although rather thin. His hair was streaked with gray. His eyes were large and expressive, although the upper eyelids drooped somewhat. His nose was long, his lips were thin, and wore habitually a pleasant smile, except when his eye perceived an enemy. At this moment his features assumed a terrible expression, and on such occasions, and whenever moved or even slightly irritated, he was seized with a fit of nervous trembling, which lasted long after the cause which provoked it had passed. An adept in all manly exercises, and especially in horsemanship, he sometimes used to ride without stopping from Rome to Naples, a distance of forty-one leagues, passing through the forests of San Germano and the Pontine marshes heedless of brigands, although he might be alone and unarmed save for his sword and dagger. When his horse fell from fatigue he bought another, where the owner unwilling to sell, he took it by force. If resistance were made he struck, and always with the point, never the hilt. In most cases, being well known throughout the papal states as a free-handed person, nobody tried to thwart him, some yielding through fear, others from motives of interest. Impious, sacrilegious, and atheistical, he never entered a church except to profane its sanctity. It was said of him that he had a morbid appetite for novelties in crime, and that there was no outrage he would not commit if he hoped by so doing to enjoy a new sensation. At the age of about forty-five he had married a very rich woman, whose name is not mentioned by any chronicler. She died, leaving him seven children, five boys and two girls. He then married Lucrezia Petroni, a perfect beauty of the Roman type, except for the ivory pallor of her complexion. By this second marriage he had no children. As if Francesco Cenci were void of all natural affection, he hated his children, and was at no pains to conceal his feelings towards them. On one occasion, when he was building in the courtyard of his magnificent palace near the Tiber a chapel dedicated to St. Thomas, he remarked to the architect when instructing him to design a family vault, "'That is where I hope to bury them all.' The architect often subsequently admitted that he was so terrified by the fiendish laugh which accompanied these words, that had not Francesco Cenci's work been extremely profitable, he would have refused to go on with it. As soon as his three eldest boys, Giacomo, Cristoforo, and Rocco, were out of their tutor's hands, in order to get rid of them he sent them to the University of Salamanca, where, out of sight, they were out of mind for he thought no more about them, and did not even send them the means of subsistence. In these straits, after struggling for some months against their wretched plight, the lads were obliged to leave Salamanca and beg their way home, tramping barefoot through France and Italy, till they made their way back to Rome, where they found their father harsher and more unkind than ever. End of section 29 Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman